Welcome back. It is a new year, but it's the same old me. I had, I don't think I've done a stream or upload in over a week. And mostly it is because I'm pretty busy and I actually am at the moment watching the college football playoff, which is not going so well because LSU is winning, but you know, good for them. So I might be a tad distracted while doing this, but the fact is that I do want to do an update. Now, I think that for the time being, there's going to be far, far less videos, even than usual. Uh, doing a lot more writing got published today. We'll get to that. Uh, I'm getting published later this week and am still doing more writing. And I think that that really is where to focus right now because you do get a lot more ideas across when people can simply open up your article, take a look and figure out what you're trying to say instead of just having it verbally delivered and then having to go back and maybe correct yourself later. So I want to start off by showing this, which is an article from Quartz, which is excellent in order to understand some of the causes of hyperinflation and how government controls and price fixing, things like that, are really the cause of massive economic failure. Now, I know some of you will probably say it's the sanctions, it's the United States and everything. Look, if sanctions by the United States are enough to doom a country, then these countries really aren't sovereign. They don't really, they're not really independent. And the fact is that in the modern world, you can still trade with the world if you have access to trade with China, India, or Russia, all three of those countries, or the EU, I guess. So if, as long as you, you, can, you can trade your goods or do business with any of those other blocks, you're basically able to trade with the whole world. That's why the Cuban embargo is largely, uh, it's, it's uh, obviously it affects the Cuban economy. It's, it costs a lot more to get goods from places further away than the United States. But it's not really the only reason that Cuba is as poor as it is. It's, it's not a country with a lot of uh, natural resources. And therefore, a lot of its economy prior to 1959 was dependent on U.S. tourism, on, on the gambling industry, things like that. Venezuela doesn't even have that excuse. They have oceans of oil under their, um, under the, under their uh, territory. And they can't seem to figure out how to run their own country. And they've basically run you know, their currency into the dust again. This is, this is, I believe, the third currency that Venezuela has tanked. Uh, this is something that's happened before. If you want to see a good channel that deals with this more, not, not, a, not a channel that I necessarily agree with all the time, but they have really, really good, um, I guess, education about both hard currencies and cryptos and precious metals, Look at Rethinking the Dollar. I actually interviewed Mike from Rethinking the Dollar one time. He's a great person. So what, what we're talking about is this modern monetary theory, something that the Australian economist Bill Mitchell has proposed. Not the same, you know, Bitch Mitchell who, you know, runs that, that, that Your Voice America or whatever it is. They believe that Money is basically an entity that is entirely dependent. In order to make any sense, money has to be a sanctioned form of tender by a government. And beyond that, its meaning is basically, um, you know, it's, 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 its meaning is entirely dependent on the authority that issues it. They don't believe that it has to do with demand. They don't believe it has to do with different commodity uh, um you know, different fluctuations in the commodity commodity market. Obviously, I think that they that they do make some exceptions because, for instance, something like tungsten, which isn't available in a given country, of course, is going to be more expensive there. I don't care how much 
authority the government has to issue currency. So, so I don't think that Bill Mitchell and the MMT people are that obtuse, but their theory is just complete bunk. And you can see it because they just keep adjusting the minimum wage in, in, in Venezuela. And at now it's 250,000 Bolivars in a month. Okay, when Maduro last waged the, raised the wage to 150,000 Bolivars in October, a month of work could buy about four kilograms of beef. But the new, so, so think about that. You could work a month and buy only nine pounds of beef. Okay, that's if you have a job. But the new hike can't even buy one kilogram due to inflation's effect on consumer prices, according to Bloomberg. A month of work on the U.S minimum wage of 725 per hour buys 137 kilograms of ground beef. Okay, so that that's how ridiculous this whole um, inequality issue is. The people who are at the very bottom of the rung of the ladder here in the United States have purchasing power that is let's see here. It's uh, over 5 times as strong as it was in Venezuela four months ago. And now it's 137 times as strong. At a minimum wage of 821 pounds per hour, workers in the UK can earn enough to buy 288 kilograms of rump steak in a month, which I, th I think rump steak is basically, I, I don't know what it is, but it might just be what they call ground beef over in Britain. The recent wage increase makes it look like there was effectively no minimum wage until necessary. So you, you see here, it's so exponentially skewed that they had to put it on, an, on a logarithmic scale because this is going back to 2008. So this is when they, they had to reissue, or 2007, they reissued the new currency probably in 2007. And you can see it's just spiking. It gets to 50,000 and then, and then it just starts to um, climb. So they, they had to put it on a log scale. That's, that's great. <laughs> Maduro has vowed to cut inflation down to a single digit this year, a stiff challenge given the prices are currently estimated to be rising at 9,900% by Bloomberg's index that tracks the price of a cup of coffee in Caracas. So, so yeah, this, this, is, this is basically a government that has messed up everything that it can. Uh, it's a, this is Venezuelan inflation measured by the cost of a cup of coffee. So in 2018... It cost, you know, a normal amount of money. Now, now Venezuela, which is right next, bear in mind, it's right next door to Colombia. And I, I think that there might even be coffee plantations in, or orchards, whatever they have, in, in Venezuela. It's 60,000 bolivars in, in, um, in, 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 uh, for coffee. Okay, so what is it? $250,000 is the minimum wage over there. Or 250,000 Bolivars, which is three dollars and sixty-one cents. So you can buy less than six cups of coffee with that. that. That's how ridiculous this is. So I don't want to hear people telling me about how it's all because of the sanctions and all because no, even countries that are undergoing sanctions have control over certain internal issues with it. You know, coffee isn't something that you get from the United States. Think about it. Think, th just use your brain. You don't get coffee from the United States. You can get it from several other countries in Latin America. You can get it from Central America. You can get it from Colombia. You can get it from uh, the the problem probably is that they that suppliers in in Venezuela probably don't have the liquid capital to pay for more coffee, and neither do the customers. So it's it's basically just a shit show there. Uh, other things that are going on that we're not going to pull up articles for because they're they're already happening. Uh, Britain, I believe, has already voted the the parliament, I should say, the House of Commons has voted to make a hard Brexit deadline by the end of the month. So no, there's not going to be any more delay. I don't think the courts can delay it anymore. It is going to be something that it has been uh, determined by. The, you know, the people, the people's voice finally will be heard almost for it's it's three and a half years after the Brexit vote. And, and you know, it's been delayed, but I think it's finally time 
And once once Britain leaves the EU, they say that some of these parties who were Remainers are not going to become rejoiners. Like, it's not enough that they've been rejected. They were rejected in 2016 by the Brexit referendum. In 2017, both of the main parties, the Labour Party and the Conservatives, the Tories, campaigned on a Brexit agenda. It doesn't matter that the Labour Party was pretty disingenuous about it. They still said so. So that was another vote that supposedly was for Brexit. And then in 2019, there were two votes. There was the European parliamentary elections, which were held only because Theresa May dithered and, and delayed, as Boris Johnson says, and couldn't get the, the UK to uh, hammer down a Brexit deal that was satisfactory to her parliament. So in that election... The Brexit Party, a, a totally new party that had just risen from out of nowhere, swept the election. So that's a third ballot. And finally, in December, four times the British people have voted for Brexit and it's finally happening. And once it's over, I think that the political landscape is going to have to change because, you know, some of these people who are obsessed with remaining in the EU, and they think it's the biggest thing ever, once it becomes apparent that the world didn't end, what's going to happen to those people? Uh, you know, do they have any credibility left? I don't think so. It's, it's, it's a new decade. It's 2020, and they're going to be dredging up 2016 problems, and they're just going to probably be left behind as the Ramoners of yesteryear. So that, that's as far as Brexit. Impeachment. The House has transmitted the articles of impeachment to the Senate officially, and that is going to be, I believe, the death knell of the Democratic ticket in 2020 for a variety of reasons. There's already rumblings among some sections of the public, ironically enough, Republicans. I, th I think so, there's probably some, some Sanders supporters who believe this too, but that Pelosi has transmitted these articles with the timing particularly to make it more difficult for the Sanders campaign. Because once this trial begins, Bernie and every other senator running, so that's Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Michael Bennett, and uh, I don't know who else is left because Cory Booker is gone, <laughs> which is going to be another gonna be another subject. By the way, I forgot to pull up any articles concerning that. So... Um, what we're talking about right now is this, um, just this, this utter sh shit show with, with regards to the timing. And, um, you know, once this trial gets underway, Sanders just has to sit there. Uh, Bennett has to sit there, even though it doesn't matter because he wasn't going to win anyway. Elizabeth Warren has to sit there. All of this them have to sit. Just out Cory Booker. Sorry, th this was playing, but all of them have to sit and basically listen to the evidence and, and they can't speak at all because they're technically the jurors. So they have to sit there and do nothing while, um, you know, the the two sides present the evidence and then pr and pretend that they're being objective about it. And everybody knows that in the end, th there's just going to be this um, acquittal probably because there's no incentive for the Republicans to vote to remove Donald Trump. It's, it's become a naked power play, especially given that we're now in 2020, we're in the election year, we're in the swing of an actual primary. And that's the whole point, that Bernie Sanders should be campaigning in Iowa. Bernie Sanders, des and, and I believe he deserves, he deserves to have the chance. I mean, the, the guy's running for president, and Nancy Pelosi has set it up so that he's basically shackled to his chair over in Washington and can't do it. Yeah, if I was a person who supported, I don't even have to support Bernie Sanders, and you know that I don't. But yeah, he's being screwed again. It's it's ridiculous. It's a disgrace to the spirit of, of what uh, electoral politics is in this country, whether you call it a democracy or a republic. I don't think this is what anyone imagined when they looked at the impeachment process that it would be, uh, I guess, activated at a, at a juncture 
when Democrats can simply campaign to remove Donald Trump from the by the ballot box. And I think that it's going to probably weaken their chances of doing it more than anything. It is probably one of the dumbest political moves of all time. And, you know, we'll get back to Cory Booker again. So um, Iran, this is something I didn't cover. Iran denies shooting at crowds protesting after the plane was shot down, down. So there was, you might remember that last week, a uh, Ukrainian plane was shot down over Iran, you know, I guess condolences to the families of the people, you know, both the fl- the crew and the passengers. Uh, understandably, a lot of the passengers originated in Iran, even if they were, I believe a lot of them were Canadian citizens. Uh, some of them probably were Iranian citizens. Maybe a few were, the, were you know, the crew was probably Ukrainian citizens. Uh, the real question is, why is it that commercial flights were allowed to travel to uh, can't to uh, sorry to Iran at this point, and what's really funny is that, I mean you guys remember there was a debate between me and Ryan Dawson a few months ago, and th- this is him again just being a complete idiot. He's oblivious to the facts. Uh, he's made videos where he essentially says that it, it wasn't really Russian. Um, it was it wasn't sorry it wasn't Iranian anti aircraft fire that brought the plane down. And he says, under decades of international sanctions, Iran's commercial passenger aircraft fleet has aged with air accidents occurring regularly for domestic carriers in recent years, resulting in hundreds of casualties. So I want, first of all, so Iran, Iran can, I believe Iranian passenger jets are are mainly from France. I think that they buy Airbus. They don't even buy Boeing. Uh, this was a Boeing aircraft from Ukraine International Airlines. So, so Ryan Dawson, in his obsession with simply deflecting any attention from a country whose media uh, arm he appears on, because that that's that's basically his job. I, I know that if you appear on press TV, it doesn't necessarily mean you're Iranian propaganda. But I believe in his case, when you try to say that. Iranian passenger jets are susceptible to to um, air accidents because of aging aircraft when it wasn't even an Iranian jet. It's pretty clear that you're not really looking at the problem itself. It's pretty obvious that you don't have the uh, motive of looking into what actually happened when you get such a basic detail wrong. And yet you th- this is a person who laughs all the time at Alex Jones laughs all the, and, and, you know, by all means, you can laugh at Alex Jones. I, I happen to be kind of a fan of Alex Jones, but I don't, I kind of look at him more for entertainment value. I don't really watch him for news that much. Also because I don't have that much time, but you know, if people don't like him, fine. If people like him, that's also good. I, I don't really have a strong feeling either way, but Ryan Dawson has this visceral hatred for Alex Jones. He hates a lot of other people who are, I would say on the, you know, they call themselves the truther community, things like that. And I don't really have any beef with any of those people. Obviously, I think some of my opinions would would not line up with theirs. But he, you know, because he's been involved in a lot of the internal politics with it, he denies the World Trade Center uh, 7 controlled demolition theory. Um, and, And a lot of people think that he's become a turncoat because he denies it. He's in a a lot of, I guess, what you would call internal beefs with those people. And the fact is that it's tweets like this that should show that he he really isn't a person in the pursuit of the truth anyway, whether you believe in the controlled demolition or not, right? I I personally, I'm reading some stuff about it. Um, It's interesting. I don't think that there's much you can do about it, Um, but... If people want to be active about it, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. I, obviously, I think that there's certain tangents that people go on that I don't believe in at all. But Ryan Dawson has complete contempt for them because it's all about him. And this tweet is all about him. He doesn't say anything about any of the um, of the victims. He doesn't say anything. And and this this was his way of passing it off as if this was not 
a an, an, a missile um, launch against the aircraft, whether accidental or not accidental. Uh, obviously, it's not. It's it's a tragedy either way, and you can't excuse Iran for uh, accidentally killing these people, but certainly an accident is is better than it being deliberate, right? So th this is a huge problem for the Iranian government. You have active protests right now that are flooding Tehran, okay? Um, and, and Ryan Dawson just basically pimps their propaganda all the time. Um, it says Iran's government has denied reports, this is from CBS, that security forces fired live ammunition at protesters in Tehran and accused President Trump of shedding, quote, crocodile tears with his message of support for the demonstrators. Videos reportedly show blood on the ground after claims that protesters were hit with live rounds in Tehran two days after Mr. Trump warned the Islamic Republic's leaders not to, quote, kill your protesters. Protesters have been denouncing their government's belated admission that an Iranian missile unintentionally shot down a Ukrainian passenger jet last week, killing all 176 people on board. Officials denied for almost four days that Iran's military was behind the crash until a senior commander conceded Saturday under mounting international pressure that that single low-ranking operator had mistakenly fired on the plane, thinking it was an incoming missile. So look, I, I mean, I, I think this should be an investigation. It's entirely possible that it was a mistake. Okay, and, and, you know, I think that obviously a lot of us here in the U.S., we don't like Iran. There are some people that have, you know, they take Iran's side here. But the investigation should look at the facts. And if it was a mistake, I think Iran still has to compensate the families. But um, you, you can't just deny things that, that, that obviously happened. That, that's what leads to cover-ups. And it's very ironic that someone like Ryan Dawson, who has complained about cover-ups within the U.S. government for years and years and years, and, and I complain about a lot of the same cover-ups, probably not as active as him by, by any stretch, but he would be complicit in this cover-up, right? It's a, this, this type of tweet is not something where you're looking for the truth. It's where you're looking to cover up for someone else's misdeeds. And it's and it, it doesn't even get the uh, you can even see in the photo that it says Ukraine International Ukrainian Boeing 737. I, I don't believe that. I mean, even even if Iran has Boeing jets, they're probably some of the older models. Right. But the majority of their passenger jets, I think, are Air, Airbus. So uh, but but from the story itself, it's not an Iranian jet. So what the hell is Ryan talking about, and why 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 does he want to be taken seriously? And look, you might be asking why am I bringing this guy up again? <clears throat> I am bringing him up again because the dancing Israelis debate has been, uh, you know, it's been on hiatus for about four months. The guy won't come back. He thinks that he can just dodge the truth. Never uploaded the stream to his own channels, right? You don't think that's a little funny since he happens to upload literally any other show that he's been on except for the one between me and him on Halsey. He had a response video where he lied again, made up complete new lies, and inadvertently admitted that he'd lied about uh, one of the movers. So, yeah, I'm not going to let it go. And you should be aware that in a few weeks... I will be doing a stream with a different YouTuber concerning it, and we're just going to press on with this because it doesn't matter what else is going on. I think that this is a worthy fight to be had between myself and this utter and complete fraud who doesn't know what the hell he's talking about and is just simply out there to cover for people that he does have a financial connection to. Um, Canada is saying Iran, Iran plane crash victims would be alive had there been no tension in the region. Well, what do you want? There's always tension in the region. Uh, the, I mean, this is, this is one of the most ridiculous stances that you can have. And, and Trudeau's showing the salt and pepper beard now. But, 
I think it's it's really a testament to how poor of a of a spine Canadian voters have that they allowed this this clown to be their leader. He, I mean, so many of their fellow citizens. I think many of those citizens might be originally Iranian, or their their parents were from Iran or something. But 57 Canadian citizens are dead because of this missile, and he's giving these very lukewarm responses to what happened. And the, the reason for that is that Justin Trudeau became prime minister in order to, you know, he, he was Obama 2.0. I'm not the only person who said this. He wanted to be celebrity in chief. He wanted to be able to... Uh, circle the globe with celebrities and go to award shows and dress well and, and, and go to Bollywood and things like that. That's the reason he became prime minister. It's not in order to serve the needs and, and uh, requirements of the Canadian people. And that's why he's been such an awful prime minister. And, and I don't think that anyone on any side of the spectrum would agree that Justin Trude would disagree that Justin Trudeau has been just uh, an utter and complete, um, you know, failure at every in every respect with, with with how he's conducted himself since he got into office. But this this is a I guess a new low for him because this was an actual case where Canadian citizens were killed in a war zone uh, through an act of of uh, either terror either negligence or what I would call you know, trigger happy, um, you know, trigger, trigger happy neglect. I, I don't know how to call it, what to call it. It's either negligence or it's trigger happy um, urge, urge to go to war, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that a leader, if, if this, if this had, for example, been someone like Duterte over in the Philippines, I don't think that this is the response that you would have heard. I think that Duterte would certainly have I don't know what he could do. Maybe maybe it would have been empty words. But I certainly think that Duterte would have probably responded much, much differently. Obviously, I'm drawing a very extreme contrast. But, yeah, there's plenty of leaders, I think, that show that they can stand up for their country much better than Trudeau. And not all of them are in, in Europe. You, you have Modi. He's Pretty solid leader when it comes to standing up for his people. Uh, Bolsonaro, the president of Mexico, even uh, Lopez Obrador, I think would probably have been very angry at this, uh, even though I don't think he's against Iran. So, yeah, it's it's really um, breathtaking how bad of a prime minister he is. Uh, this this is my new article. We'll get back to it in a second. Um, the, the women's march is falling apart. There's only going to be a handful of thousands of protesters this year in Washington, D.C. So, yeah, it looks like LSU just won the national championship. So I guess congratulations to the Tigers in Baton Rouge. Uh, you know, Joe Burrow is going to be number one in the draft now, I'm sure. Yeah, he won a national title and he won a um, Heisman Trophy. So definitely going to be going number one, probably to the Bengals. And then from there, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you uh, – I mean, I guess a lot of these guys who do well in college, they do, they do nothing in the NFL. So who knows? Uh, but after that segue, so it says, nobody needs another pink hat, why the Women's March is struggling for relevance. So this, this is from a couple of days ago. And – it's just, it's walking through this this ridiculous organization, the Women's March, that went from having hundreds of thousands of people attending this march to maybe 4,500. It says the, the 2020 Women's March expects about 10,000 people to attend Saturday's march at the White House, according to a permit application filed with the National Park Service. So that that's the number of people they applied for a permit with. But... It says about 4,500 people have indicated on Facebook they will attend. So, yes, it could be 4,500. It could be more than 4,500 because not everybody registers through Facebook. But there's also likelihood that not everybody that 
indicated they'd attend on Facebook will actually attend. So, no, this is not going to be a very successful event. And the Women's March fell apart for a number of reasons. The first reason is that uh, they're intersectional, meaning that they were engaged in a lot of stuff that had nothing to do with a central goal, which I guess was defending women's rights. They were talking about transsexuals. They were talking about the gays. They were talking about open borders. They were talking about um, all, all this other stuff that had nothing to do with it. The uh, gun control. So all of those things. So the Women's March was basically a march for people. Okay, not even necessarily women. So in some cases, they were they were dudes who decided that they were women. But it was a march of people who believe in progressive stuff. So no, I think that it certainly alienated many people that way. But it seemed to get worse and worse with with the Linda Sarsour. Farrakhan scandal. So Linda Sarsour and Tamika Mallory, both Women's March co-chairs, were supporters of Louis Farrakhan. That alienated several supporters. Uh, and and um, eventually the, the group just seemed to unravel and more and more factions simply left over time. And even last year, I think it may have only been a couple tens of thousands that attended So I suspect if Donald Trump wins uh, this November, uh, the Women's March could probably, you know, let's say they even have a protest. How, how many are actually going to turn up? Because it didn't work last time. They, 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 took, they took hundreds of thousands of people out there to protest against him. And now he's going to be a lame duck president. Um, a, an actual victory this year will probably show that all of their efforts were in vain. So I think as an organization, it's, it's largely run its course and it will probably dissolve in the next couple of years, even though, I mean, besides dissolving, the only other thing that could happen is that it would probably serve as some sort of fundraising, money laundering vehicle. So that's about it. Uh, Cory Booker is done. <laughs> Farticus is uh, wrapped up. He's, he's, um, you know, he, he's thrown the shield and sword away and he's, he's run back for the, for, for the hills and, um, all of his other gladiators are abandoning him and he's gone. Uh, it says New Jersey Senator, um, Cory Booker on Monday suspended his campaign for the democratic presidential nomination after struggling since the start to break into the top tier and failing to make the cut for the upcoming debate. And he said, it's with a full heart that I share this news. I've made the decision to suspend my campaign for president. Uh, Booker entered the race last February, but struggled to gain traction in the polls. It wasn't long ago that Booker, the energetic former mayor of, New York, of Newark, New Jersey, was considered a rising star in the Democratic Party, but he has, was outshined throughout the primary and never enjoyed a breakout moment like, like others. In his note to supporters, the Democratic knowledge, he didn't see a path to victory. It was a difficult decision to make, but I got into this in this race to win, and I've always said I wouldn't continue if there was no longer a path to victory. So let's let's watch a stupid video. Well, I have to unmute. Years ago, there was a lawyer. I am literally here on this stage right now because 50 years ago, there was a lawyer on a couch who changed his life, changed his mind to get up and start representing families, one of them mine, who were discriminated against them. Ours is the story of the faith we have had in one another. We know beating Donald Trump is the floor, it is not the ceiling. It gets us out of a valley, it does not get us to the mountaintop. It's not gonna be a referendum on who he is, it's going to be a referendum on who we are and who we are to each other and for each other. We need all Democrats together to call to this country, to stand together, to work together, to rise together. Today, I'm suspending my campaign for president with the same spirit with which it began. It is my faith in us, my faith in us together as a nation, that we share common pain and common problems that can only be solved with a common purpose and a sense of common cause.
So now I recommit myself to the work. I can't wait to get back on the campaign trail and campaign as hard as I can for whoever is the eventual nominee and for candidates up and down the ballot. But for now, I want to say thank you. Campaigning over this last year has been one of the most meaningful experiences of my life, meeting you, meeting people across this country who believe, who know that we may have challenges right now in our nation, but together we will rise. Yeah, so th- this was a tremendous waste of time for Cory Booker. And I think that the real problem with him was that once, it, it's not only him, I think once 2016 was over, once Hillary Clinton was beaten, a lot of these people started building their next presidential campaign thinking that it works the same way that it did back in the past. A lot of the same uh, messaging and uh, cadence, even in his voice, was basically just imitating Barack Obama. Right. So he is just it's 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 a joke. I mean, what what the hell is he running on? There's no central plank. Uh, he doesn't really have much of a health care policy that's unique about it. You know, Kamala Harris had the same problem. She was constantly flip flopping on what her health care plan was. Would it eliminate eliminate private insurance? Would it not eliminate private insurance? I think that unlike Kamala Harris, Cory Booker did not have the very toxic personality that that drove voters away and drove in in just um, you know in in masses. There were there were there were so many people who were turned off by Kamala Harris and and her behavior and the way she would react to things and her fakeness. Cory Booker didn't have that problem. He had the problem where he just seemed like the guy who was trying too hard to please. There was the moment in the campaign, and you'll see it. So I'll pull it up on YouTube. So this, I think, was the first debate. Uh, just wait a second. First debate when, when you'll remember Beto O'Rourke, who suffered the same issues in many cases as, as Cory Booker, this Gen Xer with a lot of... Um, I guess, eagerness to please. And he just tried too hard to please everyone. You can see it. This, this, this was something everybody remembered. What would you do, Congressman, day one at the White House? Vamos a tratar cada persona con el respeto y dignidad que merecen como humanos. We would not turn back Valeria and her father Oscar. We would accept them into this country and follow our own asylum laws. We would not build walls. We would not put kids in cages. In fact, we would spare no expense to reunite. So you, you can see, you can actually see Cory Booker at the beginning staring in that direction. There's a there's a much clearer one. Um, it's pretty funny though. We've heard tonight from New York Mayor Bill de Blasio and Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar. Now uh, another candidate who, like several debaters tonight, demonstrated uh, his Spanish fluency. Take a look. La situación la situación ahora es inaceptable. SB Presidente ha atacado, ha demonizado los inmigrantes. Es inaceptable y voy a cambiar este. On day one, I will make sure that number one, we end the ICE policies and the customs and border policies that are violating the human rights. Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey joins us now. Senator Booker, uh, thanks for being with us. How do you think it went tonight for you? I'm really excited. I think it went really well and got us to have an opportunity to have a first conversation about a lot of major issues. And for me, and right now, we have a lot of folks who are just discovering me. Our name recognition camera. So, so th- this, this was the real moment that people were talking about. So even Anderson Cooper are going to help but bring it up. Like bring police accountability uh, 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 in our country so we do not have 
uh, that kind of implicit racial bias that's so hurting our criminal justice system. Senator Booker, I just want to ask, and on a, a slightly lighter note, and I'm asking this as someone who's occasionally been caught rolling his eyes on camera, uh, there's a photo of you looking at Beto O'Rourke as he is starting to speak in Spanish. You're giving him kind of amazing side eye, and I, I wonder if you've seen the photo, what was going through your mind in that moment, if you can remember? I can't really remember. Uh, I just knew he had laid a gauntlet down and that and, and I was talking a little bit with Castro. Both he and I knew as people who can speak Spanish that now we were going to bring it as well. Um, but I yeah, yeah. So th this this whole thing was a stupid joke. I mean, what, did they have any goal in the campaign to represent a major policy, uh, whether it was on immigration? And, and, and when when I say that, I mean, Saying that you're going to basically revoke all immigration penalties is not an immigration policy. It's it's just saying that you don't like immigration penalties. Good, there's not going to be any. That's not a policy. That's that's a concession. The same way that the bail reform has been a concession to uh, petty criminals and and even some serious criminals in New York. So yeah, uh, Cory Booker is a joke. And we we now think I mean I think he's going to remain a joke for many many years. It's it's over for him. Uh, he's not going to be able to run again, in my opinion, because he's just going to be identified from now on as this Mr. Potato Head who failed miserably in 2020. So no, there's not going to be any Corey 2024. If there is, it's it's going to be even shorter than this time. Finally, so that my my personal. Um, article. This is for the New Telegraph, their Canadian group. Um, I contacted somebody from there because this article was actually turned down by a couple other publications, but it does deal with the Groyper controversy, something that not everybody wants to address. But the fact is, so I had a Groyper on, I think, about a week and a half ago. Joe Enders, who has a show called uh, Far Right or Far Wrong. And I, th I think that we do have to keep including them in uh, dialogue and conversation, but it doesn't mean we have to just embrace what they're talking about. They do believe in uh, some failed economic policies. They believe in heavy intervention in the economy. I'm not going to ruin the entire thing, but a lot of their demands, for example, Fuentes. Now, everybody's going to say, oh, he's a, he's a young guy. He's making a few mistakes. Tough, tough shit. <laughs> okay, if, if you don't want us to, um, you know, go after him, I mean, wh then why should we go, go after Greta? Why should we go after David Hogg? This guy is making mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, but everybody who makes mistakes has to live with those mistakes. He supported Andrew Yang, uh, talked about how, you know, his tweet was, the country is doomed. The, the rules don't matter. We might as well get $1,000 a month. And he wasn't the only person who did it on the Groyber side. James Alsop did as well. And it has nothing to do. Look, if people want to say that the problem with Groypers is racism or anti-Semitism or homophobia, nobody gives a shit. Those are problems that are only a problem for a certain number of people. The fact is that they are economically illiterate assholes. And... You know, except for, you know, if, if you're a Groyper out there and you're watching this, sorry, but it's the truth. You don't know shit about the economy. You don't know why uh, people d make decisions economically. Okay, you don't, you don't know the way consumer culture works. You only know that you don't like it. You only know that you think that capitalism has uh, debased humanity, but you don't have a better idea of how to run it. Because a lot of the stuff that you're proposing is a recycling of Argentina's policies from the 40s onward, right? And, and look, I could have made this about fascist economics, but I know that if I would call people fascist, people would say that I'm, I'm being hyperbolic and I'm, I'm using, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Godwin's law, the, the whatever. So no, we're not going to talk about any of the European fascists because, first of all, the war complicates that and a lot of that. Let's talk about a country that implemented the same economic policies and never ended up going to war when they were in place, except for the Falklands War. That would be Argentina. And it, it was just a complete and utter 
disaster. Uh, what did they do? They did a lot more unionization, but there was a, you know, the unions were brought under the state essentially. So the state was effectively negotiating on behalf of the workers in many cases. They did a lot of giveaways and a lot more social justice and social welfare. Those are the two main branches of Peronism with uh, Juan Peron. And what it ended up doing, it led to crazy inflation, and eventually Peron was deposed in a coup, and he had a return a few years later. He, he returned about almost 20 years later and became president again, thanks to some other shenanigans, and then he died and his wife was overthrown in a coup, his, his third wife, Isabel. So is it guaranteed to happen the way it happened in Argentina? Certainly not. But the, the beliefs of the Groypers are mainly skeptical of capitalism. And I, I want to make this clear. I can't necessarily make it a congruent comparison between Groypers and Peronists. But it's about as close as I can find it. Okay, they're always complaining about demographics. Argentina had a much whiter population under Perón and up until today than we have. So it's not a, it wasn't an issue of race because there's more white people in Argentina. You know, Spaniards, Germans, Italians, Welsh, uh, other people from, from Europe, right? Argentina is a pretty, there, there's, there's mainly Europeans and some Native Americans there. That's about it. But that didn't, that didn't give them success. Uh, the economic program of Perón was, was a huge failure. They, they tried to develop a state aircraft industry. Now, they, they made some planes, but the, did it become a successful aerospace industry? Not really, right? Uh, and, and basically, they tried to chart a middle path in the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. They didn't join either side. Uh, so they did run afoul of the U.S. that way. Obviously, I don't think that we should hold that choice against them. I don't think every, every if I don't, I don't believe in this, if you're not with us, you're against us things. So I'm just saying that it didn't work out for them economically because it burned bridges with the U.S. and America. I think America, even they, they banned Argentinian beef imports for a while. So uh, Argentina, a country that relies on the cattle industry, they lost one of their main markets uh, at that time for a while. So how does that connect to Nick Fuentes? A lot of his beliefs are all about how healthcare education and, I mean, he even has a message that he put up. He said, he said that healthcare, education, and housing are eroding young Americans' confidence in, capital, in capitalism, and therefore is not the solution. Let me see if I can open this. So, yeah, this was on Twitter. Uh, he says the country is being ripped apart and pillaged by trade. Workers are constantly undercut by waves of immigration. Housing prices are astronomical. Healthcare and education are unaffordable. Conservatives need a better answer for all this than bootstraps in Venezuela. Nicholas Fuentes lives in what state? He lives in Illinois, a state that's crippled by taxation. People are, are fleeing to Indiana, Iowa, Wisconsin, Missouri. Anywhere that borders Illinois is gaining residents from Illinois because of high taxation, overregulation. And those are the three industries that pe people should never, ever be deceived. Housing, healthcare, and education are the most subsidized industries in America. Okay, they're more dependent on government subsidy than any other industries in America. Okay, and I, I put some figures here, um, and I, with that I'll conclude. It says New York State spends more per pupil than any other state, but ranks 25th in K-12 education. Okay, annual state and federal spending on higher education amounted to over $160 billion in 2017. Okay. That's how much we're spending on education. They, these people, by the way, they, they talk about ending foreign aid to Israel. I'm in favor of ending foreign aid to Israel. So if you canceled that $3.8 billion in foreign aid to Israel, which I'm in favor of doing, so don't, don't, don't twist my words here. I'm in favor of canceling it. How would that help when you would just dump it into more education so you'd have $164 billion 
invest in education. Would that make higher education better, more affordable? No. Uh, invest it more into HUD, which has a budget of $44 billion, so instead you would have $48 billion. How does that make federal housing or, or housing in general more affordable? The subsidies themselves make it less affordable. What about health care? The combined federal health care programs today have a annual budget of $1.1 trillion. Those are Medicare, Medicaid, and S-CHIP. So this entire notion that we're taught that, you know, these people are the true voice of conservatism, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Okay. Maybe they know what conservatism is, but they don't know what, what economics is. They're basically beholden to this, this um, I guess, social conservative, uh, economically socialist philosophy. I don't know if you want to call it socialist. You can call it whatever the hell you want, Keynesian, anything you want. But it's definitely not conservative, their economics. Uh, you know, they follow Tucker Carlson religiously. And I respect Tucker Carlson. And I guess... I guess it's, it's only proper that somebody in the media criticize companies, criticize hedge fund bankers like, like Paul Singer and his Elliott Management Group. I think it's great to criticize. Uh, I don't think that the criticism necessarily presents its solution. Uh, obviously, Tucker can continue talking about the problem, but I think in a, in a couple of years, he might have to start asking Tucker, I mean, what do you want to do about it? I mean, it's a serious question. I, I think I, I take Tucker Carlson a little more seriously than I do Nick Fuentes. But but I guess for for either of them, what are you going to do if, um, you know, you're talking about these companies plundering uh, industrial areas by buying and, and, and uh, basically gutting these companies? Yeah, that's, that's a huge problem. But what is your solution to it? And what, what do you think about all these massive budgets? So that's about it for today. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can also find me on BitChute and on Minds as well as Subscribestar. All of those are at Chef Leopard and on Gab at Starscream85. And I'll talk to you later.